I want to talk about VR, and I want to talk about it uh, in a broader sense, I think, than a lot of the early introduction to it that's been made uh, that a lot of us have seen so far by trying out some of the early demos or technologies. I want to talk about, I want you to think about it, or I want to defend the idea that it is a profoundly disruptive technology. And I don't mean disruptive to an industry, but more disruptive to human behavior. Um, the comparisons that I'd make to that have come before it are the internet itself as uh, a basic tool for us, and then the smartphone. I think VR is disruptive in much the same way. Uh, when, when we think about you know, VR, we, we think about it perhaps as a gaming peripheral at this point. And I would say that from a disruption perspective, that's as silly as looking at the smartphone as a way to make phone calls or uh, the internet as a way to get news. Um, VR is, in fact, profoundly disruptive for two reasons uh, that I want to uh, give you. The first is well described by this picture, which is the degrees of freedom. Um, the interface itself. When we, inter when we interface with a computer today, we, the, the best we can do, uh, for example, in doing uh, mechanical design work on the computer, is to use a mouse, which gives us two degrees of continuous freedom. But if you assume that VR includes the idea of these hand controllers, which I can tell you it does, three manufacturers will come out with them next year. Uh, we're definitely going to get started down that road. It means that we have 18 continuous degrees of freedom, six on each hand, six on the head, with which to see and manipulate the things that we're working with and on in virtual reality. That's, a, that's an obviously almost an order of magnitude of improvement. And it means that the interface, not looking into virtual worlds, but in fact the interface that we work with things in our computer can become completely normal and lifelike. And it's a disruptive change because there are, it, it means that it'll be enormously easier for us to do things. And as we know, uh, technologies that democratize or you know, lower the cost of doing something are the surprising ones that, that, that come, come up. The second thing, so there I spoke about natural interface. The second disruptive element for VR is this idea that uh, if we can transmit the data that's gathered from these new devices across the network, we can create not just a natural interface, but also completely lifelike communication. Now, there are a lot of problems with doing that, and that's in part what my company, or to a large extent, what my company is currently working on. But basically, if we can transmit the information gathered from these devices over the internet uh, with less than about a tenth of a second delay, about a, about a hundred millisecond delay, we can, uh, we can get, we can transmit a likeness of you to somebody else so realistic that I believe we're very likely to begin using that technique as a way of being face to face and meeting with individuals or groups of people. And those two things taken together mean that, the, that, that VR can have this profoundly disruptive effect basically on human communication, which I would defend is, the, is again the big disruptor that happens when new technologies uh, affect us. Now, you will probably correctly point out that VR is one of these things that has been talked about for a long time. That's a 1987 Scientific American, and it basically says, you know, VR will transform everything in the next 10 years. Um, and, and, and Sutherland's earliest device on the right there was from the 60s. And in fact, a lot of the devices that you've seen now actually don't offer substantially better, in many ways, experiences than those earlier devices did, certainly not Sutherland's, but uh, VR headsets of you know, say 10 years ago, delivered amazing experiences of the sort that made, you know, Zuckerberg buy Oculus. Uh, so what's different this time? Well, the thing that's different this time is the cost. The same uh, aggressive competition to build the smartphones that we're now using created screens and rate gyros and other low-cost sensors that became so cheap that the $20,000 VR headsets of a few years ago will be replaced by, you know, say $500 smartphone-ish costing devices when they first come out. And that's a, big, uh, that's a big change. And that absolutely has not been true until now. I have been working on VR my whole life. And I've always you know, been fascinated by these devices. But in the back of my mind has always been the fact that there is no fundamental way to get this technology, however compelling, out to a lot of people. First generation devices will be at the price point of smartphones, meaning that if you, if you imagine something like VR climbing the adoption ramp the way smartphones did, it could literally be like less than a decade to a very substantial penetration. The second thing is this concept of the internet infrastructure itself. Virtual reality in a shared context, which is what I think is the really transformative sense, not gaming and entertainment, but, but communication uh, and, and, and work. Uh, it also requires a very fast infrastructure, and we have that. Over the last few years, all this sort of Netflix watching has resulted in a reciprocal property, which is very low ping delays. And we're less than about 100 milliseconds to Singapore at this point, which means halfway around. And so 
the, uh, um, the speed with which data can be transmitted is now below the recommendations, I cite one there, the ITU 2003, uh, recommendations regarding feeling in conversational connection with someone. So you feel actually connected to someone when the data can be transmitted from you to them at about, uh, about 100 milliseconds. Different situations like playing music or talking or talking to friends are different, but basically the rule of thumb is about 100 milliseconds that you need to get beneath. And so again, if you bring all this stuff together, um, and this is where I'm going to show you a demo of this, if you bring all this stuff together, you create the opportunity to essentially put two people in a room together.